Well, good morning, everybody. I, um, as we said yesterday, I really want to thank all of the speakers and, uh, and all of the participants, and particularly you, the audience, and, and you're so diverse, it's really fantastic, from music lovers to psychologists to physicians to scientists to music therapists, and um, it's been fantastic to have you here and interacting with us, so we've really all enjoyed it. And as I told the faculty last night, it's just been an honor to have them all come to Santa Fe for the program. And for those of you who were able to stay through this morning, our last session, you're really in for a special treat. I want to start again by um, thanking the Chamber Music Festival, Steve Ovitsky, who isn't here yet, and Mark Nykrug, who's just walking in, uh, for all of their help and all of their staff, and Ray Ann Payton and uh, Catherine Wood from the Cancer Center, and Gabriel's Angels Foundation again for sponsoring us. This morning we're in for a, a treat. We, uh, working with Suzanne and David, we wanted to do something special, really more, and I thought to me one of the most interesting things I've heard this week among many things is the impact, uh, seeing those videos in showing us how music impacts socialization even in young children, but I think we all sort of knew that, but seeing those videos were really striking to me. And we wanted to focus on a session about music and wellness, not only within the individual, but within a community itself. And when we were here last September planning the meeting, all of us loved David. And David is like this little bunny. You turn him on, and he starts talking. And you just want him never to stop. And, and sometimes he does it, which is really great. But he can talk about the most profound things. And I have to say, I still have so many thoughts about even the conversation we had last September. And for those of us who heard David yesterday afternoon, that was really terrific. So Suzanne and David and I have uh, talked about the topic today, and, and Suzanne and David have so nicely organized a morning focusing on music and cultures and communities and individuals. And so I just want to introduce David, who all of you have heard many times, who um, runs the Institute at Ohio State is a psychologist by training, yeah? No, 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 musician. Musician. Musicologist. Oh, he's a musicologist by training. Yeah. And um, really uh, has a, a great topic this morning, and his title, which I don't know if you gave this to me or I gave it to you, David, thank you. but it's Music, Culture, and Community. So thank you again thank for you. being here. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Uh, you're all going to be tired of my voice by the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, so I've... the. Uh, I've shortened my title to just music and culture here, so let's talk a little bit about well-being. So after basic survival aspects, a feeling of purpose, a feeling of belonging, a sense of comfort and security in one's life, a feeling of being respected and valued, a sense of adventure and experiential wealth in your, in your personal life. I think what's interesting is that music can contribute to many of these aspects of well-being. Many of these things relate to culture. In particular, ethnomusicologists have spent quite a bit of time talking about identity and how people gain a sense of identity out of the music that either they prefer or the music of their very specific culture or subculture that they belong to. When I graduated as an undergraduate in music, I spent uh, a, a period of time as a composer, which I'll talk about in a minute. I realized I just got one slide ahead here. Let's talk about the hedonic value of music. So music is pleasurable, uh, but that, and it's pleasurable in many different ways, but that's not the only value to art. Art can challenge us and even insult us, as I said the other day. And art has a role in expanding human experience. So it can contribute to the sense of adventure and this experiential wealth that people can, can have in their lives. I often like to think of what would Bach think today if, if he were alive? You know, if you think of the music that was available and that he would have heard in his lifetime compared to what it is that you can pull off the web today, um, what would he think about this? In, in a certain sense, there's an enormous, enormous amount of wealth of musical styles and traditions and cultures and, and, and uh, so on that, that, we are, that are accessible to us today. And it makes me wonder, what could music be? If we could come back in 100 years or 200 years, what could music be? Well, and what kinds of experiences might be possible to have with music? How might it enrich our lives in a way that we don't, it doesn't currently? So for a couple of years after I graduated with my music degree, I, I made a rather bad living as a 
a rather untalented composer. I mean, I, I worked hard at it, and, uh, um, but I really wasn't a very good composer. But like many composers, I had a certain kind of dream, which was to create music that would really be different, really give people a different experience, but that would, that would be accessible in some way, that would be really meaningful to them. So there are lots of ways of being different in ways that people just don't find that compelling. And, and Schoenberg is, is, is sort of case study number, number one on this. Now, now Schoenberg wrote, I love him dearly, he wrote some really great music, some of which we heard last night, some really terrific music. But when he ended off going off on, onto serialism, you know, he had, he had some really interesting ideas. And he, he actually had some interesting ideas about human psychology and limitations and capabilities of the listener. But he was, he was right on many things, but he was wrong on a bunch of others. For example, he, he sincerely believed that, oh, 50 years or so after, after he started composing, that people would be whistling tunes from Schoenberg's music on the street. That's never happened. There are, in our enthusiasms to create really different kinds of musics, we can often exceed human capacities, or we can do things that just aren't meaningful to people. And what attracted me to music and other cultures was always the sense that what they are are existence proofs of other ways of creating music that we know are compelling for at least some minds. So in a particular region of the world where this kind of wacky stuff happens, um, you know, think of Inuit throat singing or something like that, you know that there's a group of people for whom this is meaningful and compelling and interesting, uh, uh, and they derive pleasure from it. So as a composer, I became more and more interested in the music of other cultures. So the question is, what can we learn about musical possibilities from the study of non-Western musics and the study of non-Western musical minds? So my first, when I first started thinking about these things about 20 or 25 years ago, I thought, and I started doing experimental work, I thought, let's find an ethnomusicologist that I could collaborate with. Because I, I know nothing about field uh, research. I'm pretty much a linguistic dolt. And I knew that if you went out into the field, you really needed some people who really knew the culture, knew contacts, really, really you know, knew, knew the do's and don'ts about a particular kind of culture. So I spent a lot of time interacting with ethnomusicologists and sussing them out, trying to find ones who might be interested in doing an experiment. <clears throat> and what I discovered was that, and for those of you who are uh, familiar, interact regularly with ethnomusicologists, you know that there's a, a considerable antipathy towards any, anything empirical that's not based on uh, descriptive uh, anthropology, some uh, you know, thick description and um, uh, 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 ethnology. I was very disappointed because I, couldn't, I simply couldn't find anyone. And moreover, what I found was a huge skepticism against any kind of quantitative methodology. And I think every anthropologist is trained about the bad old days of comparative anthropology, comparative musicology, and the bad old days of all, all the sorts of quantitative things that were done. And they all know the relationship to how the Nazis carried out all sorts of just really nefarious kinds of experiments and so on. And uh, there's a strong antipathy towards anything um, quantitative. That's what I learned. Okay, well, can't find an ethnomusicologist to collaborate with. How about using some database studies? So I embarked, and this is again about 25 years ago, on building um, computer databases of ethnomusicological transcriptions of music from different parts of the world. So one of the early uh, databases we started working with was initially uh, assembled by a German named Helmut Schaffrat, and it was mostly European folk songs from ethnomusicological sources. One of the best generalizations one can make about culture is that it's geographically correlated. Part of what it means to be French is that there's certain parts of the world where French happens. So we used this database of 6,000 odd folk songs from ethnomusicological sources, and what was wonderful about this was that from the sources, we had specific village information. So we knew that this particular tune had been collected in 1906 in this village in Serbia. And, um, and, and so we were able to, what we started doing in our computer database was adding this information in, adding latitude and longitude values for all of these um, uh, musical works. And this allowed us to do something like the creation of musical maps. So here's an example of a musical map that we were able to, to generate using this data. 
Uh, back to your high school, you probably remember our old contour maps where the lines joined points of equal elevation. Or if you had a little more sophistication, you might have had isotherms, they were joining points of equal temperature, or isobars, which are joining points of equal barometric pressure. We call these isomuses. They're joining points of equal music relatedness for whatever feature that we were pulling out of the database. And what you're seeing here is, in fact, a map of uh, the distribution of minor mode pieces in Europe. And you can see uh, this is Norway and um, Sweden here. And you can see that the dark areas, as you go further east, it becomes more and more minor. You can see it. Italy is a sort of hotbed for, hot, uh, for most, mostly in the major mode. Well, what can we do with this sort of thing? So we started asking questions like, what distinguishes Slavic from Germanic folk songs? And then we thought, well, what if we just put a divider at 15 degrees east longitude and we start looking for music, what are the differences in musical features between being on one side of 15 degrees um, east longitude and on the other side? And what we found was, in fact, greater variety of phrase terminating pitches. What does this mean? It means that when you, the further east you go, the greater the tendency for each phrase to end on the tonic. So there's da da dee da 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 ba 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 da da dee da ba ba ba. You keep coming back to the tonic. As you move, move further west, there's greater variety that happens. So that was an, an example of something that we could find. Well, a common uh, idea that people had for a long time is that somehow music is influenced by language. And Ani Patel did a beautiful study, uh, we'll talk in, in a minute about this, related to that. And he stressed this distinction between English and French. So English as a Germanic language is a strongly inflected language, where as French as a Romance language is not very inflected at all. If you listen to French, um, to English ears, it, it often sort of sounds like a, bit, like a sewing machine. So, parler en français pour moi c'est comme un musicien débutant qui joue Mozart. There's a thing that happens there. Whereas to French ears, English tends to sound like because it's so strongly inflected. In fact, the French to French ears, they characterize English as sounding like a fly buzzing around your ears, which is not an inapt description of English in terms of its prosodic stresses. <clears throat> so, uh, Annie applied a standard. Um, tool from linguistic uh, prosody called pairwise variability. This is just simply measuring how stressed pairs of successive syllables are and applied it to the case of music. So in this paper by, by Annie and one of his colleagues, they sampled 300 themes from English and French instrumental music, and they just simply measured how contrasting these, this, if you have high contrast of strong weak, strong weak, or mostly the same kind of thing, you, you end up with these different results. And he found that English instrumental music is more inflected which reflects what happens with English um, um, language. So with uh, Joy Ohl and one of my students, we uh, expanded that study to 10 times the amount of, of music, and we found exactly the same results. So basically, there's a difference between French and English music, even for music that's instrumental, not just uh, sung. And basically, English music skips more. And I've given two sort of exemplar pieces here. <clears throat> so indicative of the sort of lack, relative absence of inflection in French, da da di dum ba ba ba, where each of the notes tends to be very, very similar in duration and not very stressed. And uh, this is the exemplar I've given here for English, is the English country garden. Ba ba da da ba da ba da da ba da da. There's more of this contrast, uh, so you, you see this element. Okay, so over the years in my lab, we've encoded tens of thousands of transcriptions of non-Western music from over 100 cultures, and we've also got very large databases, very large databases of uh, traditional uh, Western classical music as well as popular music. So let me tell you about a, f a lesson that has had a big impact on my life from these uh, database studies, especially as we related it to some perceptual experiments. <clears throat> so there's this traditional concept if you're trained as a musician, of melodic leaps tend to be followed by a step in the opposite direction. Da, da, da. There's that sort of structure of a large, a large leap followed by a step in the opposite direction. Now, the step part is a little bit suspect here because the vast majority of musical, in, musical intervals are steps. Leaps are relatively uh, rarer. So the really important part of this is what we call post-skip reversal, the idea that a melodic leap is followed simply by a change of direction. The, whether it's a, 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 um, a step or a leap afterwards, the, the principal part here is that after a leap, there's a change of direction. <clears throat> and, and musicians learn this. Now, there's an alternative to this notion of why we might see this effect, 
And that is a statistical artifact that some of you, if you go back to your statistics course, you might have learned something called regression to the mean. And regression to the mean is actually difficult to understand. <laughs> Even statisticians make errors in trying to understand re regression to, to the mean. So here's, here's a way of thinking about this. So let's imagine you're walking down the street and, and there are people passing by. And what you're interested in is the height of each person passing by. <clears throat> so you might have a short person that walks by. And now we're going to ask you the question, is the next person that passed by, are they going to be taller or shorter than the person you just saw? Okay. So if you see a short person walk by, you might say, ah, I'll bet the next person's going to be taller than the person I just saw. Now really, the operative uh, principle here is that the, the likelihood is that the next person you see is going to be of average height. That's the operative thing. That's what's really going on. So if you see a short person, and they're followed especially by a tall person, then, and we ask you, what's the likely thing to happen next? Well, in statistical terms, the thing that's likely to happen next is somebody of average height. Okay, so notice that the presence of a tall person does not cause the next person to become shorter. Right? There's no causal connection. It's just simply the next person's likely to be of average height. Now, we could apply the same thing to music. When we have a large leap, the thing about large leaps is they tend to take the melody away from the central region of where the, where the pitches are comfortable. So if you have a la, da, well, the problem here is that my voice doesn't go a whole lot higher than that. So there's a whole lot more choice of pitches if I go down than if I go up. Yeah. So we did, with Paul von Hippel, we did a whole series of very in-depth studies about this. So let's just give you an example here. We're going to look for is to see whether the operative principle in music is post-skip reversal. That is, every large intervals tend to be followed by a change of direction. Or is it regression to the mean? The next pitch is more likely to be close to the center of where you would be singing. So I've got four examples here. Here we've got, so the median pitch, this is the average pitch, you can think of as the average pitch in a melody, is this dark line through the staff. And we're starting from the average pitch, or the median pitch, and we have a leap upwards. Now both post-skip reversal, post-skip uh, post reversal would say the next pitch is going to go down. But regression to the mean also says the next pitch is likely to go down, because the next pitch is likely to be closer to the mean. What about this case where we straddle over well, again, they both make the same prediction. Post-skip reversal suggests that the next pitch is likely to go down, whereas regression to the mean suggests it's also likely to go down. Third case, what if we jump up to the median pitch? Again, post-skip reversal says it's going to change direction and go down, whereas regression to the mean says, eh, doesn't matter. This is likely to go up or go down 50-50. And then the final case. What if we have a leap that leaps towards the mean, but we're still not at the mean? In the case of post-skip reversal, you're still expecting it to go down. In the case of regression to the mean, the greater likelihood is that it will go up. So now we can ask the question, what happens in real music? Does real music conform to post-skip reversal, or does it conform to regression to the mean? And here's the data. So what you're seeing here in the first case both post-skip reversal and regression to the mean predict that it should change direction. And that's what happens for the vast majority of cases. In the median crossing, once again, both make the same prediction that there should be a change of direction. When we jump onto the mean, post-skip reversal says it should change direction, whereas regression to the mean says it should be about the same. And in the case of when we approach the, me the median pitch, Post-skip reversal says it should go down, whereas regression to the mean says it should go up. Now, this is very informal. We do more formal analyses, multiple regression analysis, and when we do the multiple regression analysis, what we find is that after accounting for regression to the mean, there is no residual consistent with post-skip reversal. And I use the word no advisedly. It's zero. It's zero. There is no post-skip reversal in music. It's all regression to the mean. Okay? Now, we were so appalled by this, because all musicians are taught this, that we thought, so it's just to the conclusion here, melodic leaps are not followed by a change of direction, more than would be expected by regression to the mean, which is to say, more than would be expected by chance. So 
we got, we got carried away with this. We, th we just simply couldn't believe it. So we, you know, our initial samples, I forget, we you know, probably looked at uh, two or 300 pieces with hundreds of thousands of notes. And so we expanded that and we looked at thousands of pieces with millions of notes. And we, we looked at music spanning five centuries. We even looked at music from all sorts of other cultures like Ojibwe music, nada. There's no post-skip reversal anywhere. It's all regression to the mean. Well, this really struck us. So then we thought, hey, wait a minute here. It may not be in the music, but what if people expect it to happen? So what we did was we carried out, and I say I, we here, it was Paul von Hippel who carried out this, this experiment. And, and actually, there were two experiments. Paul did one, uh, and Brett Arden did another. And what we did was we tested people's expectation. So when you have, uh, I, I won't go into the details of the experiment, but we tried to figure out if you have a low pitch followed by another higher pitch, but still it's low, do people expect it to continue on upwards? That is, is their expectation in accordance with regression to the mean, or is their expectation in accordance with post-skip reversal? And we varied all the conditions and so on. And what we found was it was consistent with post-skip reversal. In other words, if you have a very low pitch followed by another lo lo low pitch, they still think it's going to go down, even though the likelihood is that it's going to go up. Our expectations, so what does this mean? It means that post-skip reversal is a description of human minds, not music. Everybody follow that? So, yes, Western enculturated listeners expect melodic leaps to change direction under all circumstances. So here's the lesson. There are patterns that are perceived by listeners that do not exist in the music. Let me say that again. There are patterns that are perceived by listeners that simply don't exist in the sound. They don't exist in the music. They're not there. And of course, what we learned from Schoenberg is that there are objective patterns in the music that are not perceived by listeners. All right? so, there's this complementary thing going on here. There are things that we bring to the music that just simply aren't there, but they're part of our enculturation. They're part of what we experience. So the repercussions for this. Studying the sound recordings and transcriptions or notations assembled by ethnomusicologists will not allow us to infer what culturally knowledgeable listeners perceive or don't perceive. That's a serious lesson. It means all these databases, all of these things that ethnomusicologists have put together we can't actually figure out how people experienced those things or how they heard them just on the basis of those things. Musical databases aren't as useful as one might think in discovering differences of musical minds. You can't tell how listeners from a given culture perceive music without carrying out controlled perceptual experiments. That's the key. Okay, so chapter two, let's go back and do some cross-cultural experiments. And of course, this means let's renew our efforts to find an ethnomusicologist who would be interested in a collaborative study. So once again, I go and I find three ethnomusicologists who are really wonderful people. I really admire them, do great work. They're all actually well known in the field and I can't use their names. And they're just really intrigued and very eager to give advice, but they ultimately decide that they can't collaborate because of fears of ostracism from ethnomusicology colleagues for engaging in empirical work. <clears throat> so after 20 years of this, finally bite the bullet, you think? <laughs> it's time to do it. <laughs> okay. So what do I know about these things? So in this remaining time, I'm going to tell you about how I felt that, it, well, it's time to actually do something. So trip number one. When I did my first trip, I thought, it's important not to have a research program. What I need to do is go somewhere and just find out what it's like, you know, not go with any pre preconceived notions. So I went to Nuku'alofa in the Kingdom of Tonga, which is the only place in the Pacific that was never colonized. And I spent some time there, and it was a very interesting experience, and I learned a lesson. So the purpose here was to get a feel for what's out there. And the lesson I learned is that music is heavily influenced by Western culture. So the most popular music in uh, Nukolofa and throughout uh, uh, Tonga uh, is reggae. And uh, there's local reggae, but reggae is really the stuff that's hot. So trip number two. This trip was to the Avari region of the Amazon. Now, this is actually a closed region. You're not allowed to go there. The government forbids it. You have to have special permission to go there. Some of you may have read way back in 2001, there was a, a tribe, yet another tribe, that had made um, Western contact in 2001, and that was in the Avari region. 
So it's on the border between Peru and, and Brazil uh, there, and uh, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, and five years earlier, there had been a, 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 an effort to make a nature preserve there. So there was a biological expedition. There were 30 biologists that went out. Um, uh, there were the caiman specialists and the howler monkey specialists and the upper story bird specialists and so on. There was one anthropologist that came along and one musicologist. I was just interested in seeing, can we find people who really are, so the, the purpose was, are there pristine cultures unfamiliar with Western music? And the answer is, it's harder than you think. In the three weeks that we were there, we, enc uh, we encountered um, three traveling groups. And uh, each of these family groups had a transistor radio. Um, what every anthropologist knows is that before you make contact, tra uh, trade is, makes things go a long way. And um, they were all, you can't pick up any radio in that area. It's too far away, except at night, when the gods of the ionosphere make it possible to pick up these powerful transmissions from Manaus and Iquitos and so on. And they were all familiar with Christina Aguilera and mariachi music and so on. So finding that pristine culture is harder than you think. So trip number three. This is to the Cook Islands. And this time, my purpose is, what do people consider traditional music? And in the Cook Islands, I encountered this music called Iminituki, which is very prized there. It's a wonderful, wonderful music. I can only describe it as it, it, it's like nothing you've heard before. The closest would be something like gospel. In fact, when the singers, you, you get these very rotund women, for example, who end up standing up on chairs and just dancing on chairs. They're, you keep thinking the chair is going to collapse. They're just so excited by this music. It's really great music. Um, but it's four-part harmony and it conforms to the standards of Western harmony. Um, and it shows the marked impact of, in the 1840s of the London Missionary Society. So all over the Pacific, you'll find all these Methodists uh, who are the legacy of the London Missionary Society and who do wonderful four-part singing and, and, and so on, and who have transformed the, the music in, in, in ways that are culturally distinctive. But you can hear the imprint there. So, what people there, of course, they were very proud of this music, and, and rightly so. But as a musician coming from the West, you become aware that what people think is very traditional music, they're unaware of just the enormous extent to which Westernization has taken place. So trip number four, this is to a little village called Filinovskaya in Volgograd province in Russia. And here, you know, the purpose of this trip is to gain some hands-on experience with field work. So here I'm working with Yelena Minyak, who's from the National Folkloric Archives there, and we spend this time recording um, music, a uh, style of music called Old Cossack Songs. <laughs> this is mind-blowing stuff. You, none of you have ever heard this before. Uh, it's pretty, pretty rarefied. It's usually sung by anywhere from five to 10 or 12 singers. It's improvised, polyphonic, vocal music that's best described as improvised, <laughs> what did I say, polyphonic, uh, vocal heavy metal. <laughs> you have never heard people sing so loud in your life. And it just, it's this incredible uh, kind of sound. There was one woman, they were all in their 80s and 90s. And there was one woman, Elisaveta, she was clearly the most knowledgeable there. She was in her late 80s. And when we came, she hugged us all and she said, all my life, I've been waiting for someone to come and record the songs that I know. And we spent all this time recording, and at the end, again, she hugged us, this time with you know, a fair bit of vodka behind everybody. <laughs> and, and she said, you know, she was so grateful that we'd recorded all these things, and she said, and now I can die. And a month later, she died. Yeah. So what I learned there was that there are entire musical traditions that are vanishing. The people in the villages, they just want to get out of there and they go to the cities. They're listening to you know, Western blues or you know, even bluegrass music. They're not interested in this music at all. Trips four, five, six, and seven are to Micronesia, and the purpose now was to collect data for a covariate enculturation method. So let me describe this. This is what I concocted. I came to the realization that you can't find a pristine, it's very difficult to find these pristine cultures. So the problem in carrying out an experiment, since everybody has had this access to the West, is let's imagine we carried out an experiment in which we found similarities between this culture and Western listeners. Does that mean there's some sort of universality to what the experience is, or is that an artifact of Westernization? How would you ever know? And if you can't find any cultures, or it's very difficult to find these that you can do these, these tests with, 
you're stuck. You'd never be able to resolve these issues of just what's the result of westernization and what's not. So I thought deep about this and thought, how can I make use of a, produce an experimental method that would allow me to get around this problem? So here's what I did. The proposal is to measure the degrees of musical westernization for a series of cultures, to carry out identical experiments in each locale, and then to use the degree of westernization as a covariate in the data analysis. Western influence behaviors will exhibit positive regression with a degree of westernization. Okay, in lay terms. Let's imagine we could have a series of cultures in which all of them had been Western, had, had some involvement with West, but some were extremely Westernized, a little less Westernized, a little less, a little less, a little less, and a little less. And now we do, if we run the experiment in each of these, we use that measure of the degree of Westernization as a covariate in the analysis. And if we find that the behavior is this in this culture, and this in this culture, and this in this culture, then we can be pretty sure that that's a complete artifact of Westernization. But if we find exactly the same results in each culture, then we know, because the covariate will, will come out with a, a zero effect then, we know it's probably innate. So I needed to find a place where I could look at lots of different cultures and measure the degree of musical westernization. So I went to Micronesia, that's where I decided. Micronesia, there are several thousand islands that span the distance from New York to Los Angeles. It's a very, very broad swath out there in the Pacific. About 300 of the islands are inhabited. There's a combination of Melanesian, Polynesian, and Filipino origins. And it spans four countries, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, and also Guam is in the middle of that. About 30 languages are spoken, but um, because of a, uh, United Nations trust territories in the post-war period, um, the English became the lingua franca there. So because of these languages, and there was an, an effort by the United Nations for them to amalgamate into bigger countries. They were just these tiny little, little islands. Um, they use English as a way of communicating with the people on the other island who are part of your same country. So this made it easy. It made it easier for someone like me to go there and do some measurements. So I was measuring the degree of music westernization by using two things. One is radio sampling. Every time I go someplace, I have, a st I have actually a standard radio. <laughs> and what I do is I carefully go over the dial. I find out anything that's available for people to hear on this island. And of course, there are many islands in which there's no radio at all. In some, there might be one radio station. In others, there might be two or three. In others, a uh, place like Guam, I think there are 15 or 17 or something radio stations there. The other thing I do is, radio, is, is retail sampling. Whenever I go to an island, I ask people, where can I buy some music? And I find the three, what people think are the three best places to buy music, and I do a complete inventory of the music that's available for sale. And so what I can do for each of these islands then, for each of these little cultures, is I can have a characterization of how much music in the radio and in, um, in, uh, available for sale, how much of it is local, how much of it is regional, how much of it is Pacific, and how much of it is uh, westernized and so on. So I, we can actually characterize these for each of these, these, uh, these, these islands. What was wonderful was that it turned out that the radio sampling and the retail sampling were beautifully correlated. So you can use one or the other to pretty give you a pretty good estimate. The idea here is that these will be the principal determinants of what kind of music people are hearing on these islands. So here's, here's my list. Kwajalein is the most westernized of all of these islands. Uh, Kwajalein is basically a suburb of Boston. I mean that literally. Most of the people that live there are from Boston or from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the reason why is because there's a huge radar base there and they're mostly professors of electrical engineering from MIT who run these enormous uh, radio things there. It's based, as I say, basically a suburb of Boston. Guam is a little, uh, it's still very westernized, but there's a Chamorro culture there. There's some other things. Rota in the CMNI in the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, a little less so, Majuro, Koror, Ponape, Koshe, Yap, and now Yap, we're, now we're starting to get really out there. Um, and then it was, it's been so wonderful going to places like Falalap. So let me tell you a little bit about, Falalap is in the Ulithi Atoll. And it's very traditional. There's no, <laughs> there's certainly no radio there. There's no telephones. There's no, in fact, there's no regular air service. They have one radio in which they can call in the, uh, the missionary plane from Yap if there's some uh, deep problem there. But it, they're wonderful people, and I ha I've had such a great time in, in, in Ulithi, in, in this case in Falalap. It's pretty traditional. Men tend to wear loincloths. Women typically are bare-breasted, uh, although that's changed in just the last three years. You're seeing much less of it. 
Um, oh, and here, by the way, they're singing. This woman here, I, I don't know if you can see this. This woman really knows her music very well. This woman doesn't know her music quite so well. And then in this next frame you can see, this woman is cringing because this woman is singing when she shouldn't be singing. <laughs> okay. Um, now all of these islands, I say, are touched by, uh, by Western culture. And in the case of the Ulithi Atoll, they're all Catholic. And, uh, and this particular celebration that you see these photographs from is for the retirement party for Father Nick who had retired. And uh, of course the Catholic Church does things like when, a, when a, a, a priest retires, they give him a gift. Here's Father Nick with his gift. <laughs> so things on the island are, are changing rather rapidly. Um, never has so much music been so easily available. You go online and you can download millions of recordings from Spanish flamenco to Inuit throat singing as a consequence, people are aware of the diversity of world music as never before. But this rich cacophony may be the soundtrack to a collapse in diversity of musical minds. A Nigerian group might sing in Yoruba, but the harmonies follow the harmonic principles described by Rameau's Harmony Treatise of 1722. Native American Navajo singers make valiant efforts to preserve their musical traditions, but to the trained musicologists, their singing bears the unmistakable imprint of Western scales. The casual listener hears a wealth of variety. The musicologist detects a rapidly spreading monoculture, albeit expressed in many forms. Linguists know how fast languages disappear. Musical cultures may be an order of magnitude more fragile. It will be many centuries before the whole world speaks Mandarin or whatever language you think might be there. But meanwhile, Western music has spread across the globe faster than aspirin. Robust musical cultures remain in places like China, India, Indonesia, and the Arab world, but even in these regions, most people are thoroughly acquainted with Western music through film and television. Less robust musical cultures are disappearing rapidly and are showing deep infiltration by Western musical foundations. Many have already disappeared. There remain only a few isolated pockets, such as in the highlands of Papua New Guinea and Iria Jaya. Regrettably, most cognitive scientists are ill-equipped to do remote field work and few ethnomusicologists know how to do an experiment. This situation must change rapidly if we were to have much hope of glimpsing the range of possible musical minds. We have perhaps a decade or so left before everyone on the planet has been brought up with Western music or its derivatives. Of course, we shouldn't underestimate future researchers' methodological cleverness in separating hybrid culture experiences from their, constituent, um, their prior constituents. And it may be that the most important lessons to be learned about music can all be found in Western music. But who would be so rash as to rely on these hopes? In future centuries, music scholars may well curse our generation. We are the generation that have the technical means to study different musical cultures, and we still have a few isolated cultures to study. But in the long span of music research, thinking in terms of hundreds of years, we live at that one unique and fleeting moment where we have access to both of these. People before 100 years ago couldn't do it. People 100 years from now won't be able to do it. Well, there's still hope with things like animal studies and developmental studies and yes, even database studies. So we do hope to really learn something about the musical minds of others, but it's still a challenging thing. And that's my little story for today. So as I told you, you would love David. Um, David, you've given us so many great lectures and, and talks at this meeting, and, and you're just fantastic oh, to listen. You. No, I mean, I just love, I could hear you talk all day, because the topic is fascinating and really important, and I think you have very, very <coughs> profound things to say. So Mark. Uh, David, I don't know if you know this, but one of my favorite stories altogether uh, I knew a man who had done the first international tours of gamelan music from mm -hmm. Indonesia. And thinking that European audiences would not have any idea of, of what this even meant, he gave this group he was going to tour a recording of Benjamin Britten's a young person's guide to the orchestra and said, why don't you start 
with a piece based on this so people can understand what the different mm -hmm. gamelan instruments are. And so they made up something, obviously not from their culture, to begin the programs. Uh, they went on tour. They played in England. Britain heard them, not knowing <laughs> that he was listening to something inspired by something his own inspired work. by his own and was inspired to write a piece called the prince and the pagoda based on uh. balinese music which was actually based on his own music <laughs> <laughs> that's a lovely story i wanted to ask you david i noticed that most of the research was done on folk music or music of community making which was and I'm wondering, I've spent about 25 years traveling to different cultures mm -hmm. and went to University of Washington as an ethnomusicologist. Oh, good. And um, also a music educator. And I, part of my focus was to find repertoires and genres of music that were different or unique to the culture. And I'm wondering if you've ever looked at the healing music of other cultures, the music that's used in healing sessions. Uh, I haven't looked. Uh, explicitly at that. Because you've traveled so much, so I, I'm, I'm hungry for... Yeah. <laughs> I, I, any, anybody who's done something like ethnomusicology or field work or whatever, I, I, the, the thing that's fun about it is that it's such a rich experience, you, you come back with so many stories. Uh, you know, and they're all, they're all things, it's not just, you know, places without toilet paper. <laughs> you know, uh, but it's, it's really hard to to, to summarize these things, other than just going into to, to anecdotes. There are some musical riches out there, but you, I, it is, you do become intensely aware of how much Western impact has had. It's just really striking. It's huge, and it's, I agree. It's, it's huge, a... and moreover, it's, it's tragic because often people really don't, the people that are making the music really don't have any understanding of just how deeply entrenched in Western right. um, music, so can it, I, music it is. Can I ask you both yeah. a question then? Do you think healing music might be less susceptible to the westernizing sort of influences you're talking about? Well, that's or what does I healing no, music actually, itself also evolve, David? My, my own um, impression from going to these various places is that the one kind of music that seems to be the most robust and the most resistant to change is um, cradle songs. It's mothers interacting with their babies. So it's such a personal and, you know, it. it Often what happens is sort of Westerners go to these places and there's now this demand for sort of the tourist aspect of it. So you start taking the fancy music from whatever the uh, um, uh, culture you do and you kind of package it for the kind of, the, 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 you know, these uh, Polongis who've come, who've, these foreigners who've come in. Um, but things like cradle songs and these uh, play songs, children's play songs and so on, I think they're much more robust. They're, they're less susceptible to those kinds of influences. Yeah, part of what I discovered, too, and just to pose it to you and love to send you some recordings um, for your opinion, and that is that a lot of <laughs> healing music repertoires are not open to the public. So yes. even, even yeah. the communities themselves, these are sacred repertoires. They're only used during healing sessions. And I've recorded some of those, and I'd love your opinion on that sometime. Yeah. Um, and unique, unique music, unique patterning. This was really interesting for me to watch but the Kuna Indians, some of the villages mm -hmm. in India, um, I lived in Indonesia, just this music is such difference from the folk music. So. But David, you said that one thing that struck me for here in New Mexico, that even the Navajo flute songs, a, mu a trained musicologist can hear a westernization of that music that, do you think that culture perceives that? No, I don't think so at all, no. I mean, uh, a lot of Native American music has been Dorianized. It's basically in Dorian mode. Um, uh, and I think people are just not aware of that. Peter. Um, so I'd like to um, get you to speculate a bit on something that combines um, your ideas about biological mechanisms that underlie musical features, musical preferences, and what you're talking about here. Um, kind of along the lines of the debate that's always raged as to is there something innate about Western harmony and things like that that people like. 
And so you've pointed to this westernization of these various cultures, but in, it seems that it, so the question is, why does the westernization persist? Because yeah. in, in principle, uh, there's the period of exposure, but there, yeah. there could still, there's an active decision to then engage in that way, as opposed to simply saying, ah, we don't like that. Um, you know, we're going to stick with the music we had because we like that more. And so is this the case kind of of a food that all of a sudden we like, even though it's not good for us, but we yeah. now consume it because somehow it's, it's more pleasing. So what does this say about innate mechanisms for Western music? So I, I, I agree with you entirely. I think, um, you know, a very good example of this is uh, the adoption of Western music in China. So, you know, the Shanghai Conservatory very early on and this rampant spread, you know, so many of the best musicians in the world now are, China, are from China. Uh, best classical musicians, I'm sorry, I should have qualified that. The best uh, classical musicians. Are, there's been an adoption of classical music in a place like China that you, is amazing. Now, the traditional view within anthropology, and it, it, they're really trying to avoid Western bias, so usually the interpretation of the, these enthusiasms is that they're uh, consequence of uh, colonialism or, or uh, post-colonial uh, influences. Um, and I think that there's no question that there's a lot of that stuff going on in the world, and it may be also true in this case. Except that where I grew up um, in northern Alberta in Canada, um, you know, the one thing I've noticed about a lot, large parts of the West is that just about every little town and village has a Chinese restaurant. And so you have to ask the question, what was it about the Chinese? What is it about Chinese cuisine? You don't hear a whole lot of Chinese music. You know, you don't go to the local village in, in Arizona and find, you know, the, the local um, um, Arhu players and so on that are really into Chinese traditional music. But you will find a Chinese restaurant. So I think the, this reverse scenario, the fact that Western music has become so compelling in China, whereas Western food, cuisine, and I'm, by Western cuisine, I'm saying up until 1950. Because after that, the commercialization of food in the West became optimized to increasing fats and so on to make it really compelling for everybody. But if you take you know, your sort of British you know, uh, roast beef and potatoes or something, that didn't make very much inroads in the rest of the world. So there must be something, I think, that is compelling about Western, Western music that a lot of other, I, I, I'm speculating here, that other cultures really do find attractive and that we can see evidence of this that it's not just colonialism in the fact that often we find certain cuisines from these cultures, th those have made huge inroads in our own culture. So there's, there's, I think you're exactly right. There's something else going on there. There may be some things about Western music that are, that are more compelling than a lot of other the mu musics in the world. So uh, a great experiment about that would be, and, and you must think this way, David, is if you go back to the experiments that Ani and Peter showed about socialization yeah. in response to music. Yeah. So is there something about the harmonies or the tones of Western music that make a more positive social interaction from a biologic basis? And Have we studied that compared to other forms of music that you're talking about? And we need things like controls of looking at metronomes. If we just use metronomes, <laughs> is that gonna produce the same effect? You know, one, yeah. one hopes of hope that it's not just a metronome that'll do it, yeah. But I mean, would, it, would yeah, that be exactly. an amazing experiment to do? It would be a wonderful experiment to do, yeah. So if the actual adaptation is a positive thing rather than the negative thing we actually yeah. perceive it may be, yeah. I'm wondering about the percentage of neuroscientific studies being done with Western music versus non-Western mm. music. Um, I'm not a scientist, but just on a very cursory scan of the field, it seems to me that there's a lot of inquiry, um, for example, between trying to understand the relationship between music and language and what is happening at the brain level as opposed to the musical mind level. Um, and whether or not the, what is being learned there might change if those, if those neuroscientific investigations were being done with non-Western music. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think what happens in all research is we start with what we know and we start with our own enthusiasms. So one can legitimately make the claim that the history of music psychology, for example, over the last 100, 150 years uh, has been biased towards uh, Western art music. And that's probably just simply because the people involved in it just love classical music. 
what's happened in music therapy, for example, is that you can't, you just simply can't be a good music therapist if you're not really conversant with popular, all the various forms of popular music, because that speaks so, to so many more people. Um, and I think that, you know, a large part of this is just simply background. The researcher brings all the stuff to what it is that he or she does, and including their own taste, their own, and, and of course, the convenient samples we use, 90% of the experiments we, that I do are with uh, um, young adult, uh, freshman, sophomore uh, students in, in music in central Ohio. And, and actually, they're kind of interesting because looking for that pristine culture that has been uninfluenced by another culture, I think I found it. <laughs> because if you, there are large, large swaths of the Midwest which have been unaffected by anything else in the world, <laughs> at, at least musically. Um, yeah. So, but, but they are convenient samples, yeah. We, yeah. So David, thank you so Thanks. much for this presentation. And, and also, I just have to thank you for your so many wonderful um, contributions to the symposium and the events of this weekend. So thank you for being here. Uh, and thanks again, as I said, to all of our faculty.